awkward setup here, don't we? I'm going to just pivot a bit. I love my team right here. Yeah, I just want to make sure I can see the, the wider audience because you made an effort to join us here today. And I see a lot of familiar faces, so I feel badly that you're going to hear me talk yet again today. But we do have a couple of messages that we want to share with all of you. So thank you for being here in this session. Um, regional cooperation is a priority topic for the OAS. Um, and I think if it's not a priority topic for all of you, I hope it will be by the end of the session. So to help convince you, I am going to discuss three things, or make three points um, over the next few minutes. And I promise I'll try to keep you awake. First, why are regional efforts important for capacity building? Two, why should we share with or learn from other regions? And three, what are some examples of effective cyber capacity building cooperation? I'm going to show you that it really can work. But let me start at the beginning. Why are regional efforts important? This audience, this small but mighty audience here, of course, knows that cybersecurity or cyber resilience is absolutely critical for sustainable development, economic growth, and social prosperity. That's the theme of this entire conference, right? Cyber resilience for development. And I think we also all here know that one of the most straightforward ways we can develop that resilience and strengthen our national or collective cybersecurity posture against a constantly evolving threat landscape is through capacity building. Capacity building can take many different shapes and sizes. It can be through classroom type lectures, it can be through practical tabletop exercises, or it can be through peer review type discussions. It can be virtual or in person. It can be for government actors or industry. But regardless of the format and regardless of the participants, there is a common and critically important denominator in all of these options. Communication and dialogue. It sounds so simple and straightforward, doesn't it? But in reality, fostering communication and exchanging information especially around cyber resiliency, is often much easier said than done. Regional multilateral organizations like the OAS can really play an important role in this regard. A regional organization like ours has extensive knowledge of the history, the culture, and the unique particularities of our region as we are able to bring together to convene 34 Actually, we're 33 member states of the Americas, as well as industry partners, civil society, and academia in a way that few others can. And I am confident that the same can be said for other regional organizations like the EU, the OSCE, the AU, and ASEAN. Of course, each region surely has a vision for what cyber resilience should look like. The OAS vision, for example, is for us all to arrive at a place where there are known rules for what is or not acceptable to do in cyberspace, where governments and stakeholders can effectively identify and respond to cyber threats and vulnerabilities, and where each region develops an educated workforce that can operate quickly and effectively in this fast-moving realm. We, the OAS, are therefore developing cybersecurity programming for our region that will help develop cyber diplomats who can facilitate strategic decision making, build a cybersecurity workforce that's capable of addressing evolving threats, and promote gender uh, parity in this area. And I can truthfully say that over the past 20 years, which is as long as we've been operating in this region, we've made some really good advances. But, as we've all heard said a million times before, the cyber threats are increasing, and they know no borders. 
Cybersecurity is a collective responsibility, and we all absolutely have to agree that we can be stronger and more resilient if we work together. This takes me to my second point. Why? Why should we work cross-regionally? It is no secret that diverse ransomware attacks have been incredibly costly for many governments and agencies across the globe. COVID-19 also complicated our work with the explosive growth of online users and the fact that governments quickly accelerated investments in digital infrastructure. These same digital investments require comprehensive security protections. So this reality, this constantly evolving reality, has challenged us all to identify new approaches to cybersecurity policies and guidelines and to develop the infrastructure necessary to support them. Why should we do it alone? Many valuable lessons can be learned from the experiences of others, both the successful experiences and the not-so-successful experiences. No one has all the answers figured out, at least not yet. So the OAS strongly believes that fostering the exchange of cross-regional knowledge, experiences, and expertise can truly help advance effective and sustainable global cybersecurity solutions. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, this is typically much easier said than done. But there are some really simple, straightforward steps that regions and regional organizations can take to begin to implement this approach, mindful, of course, of language considerations and levels of cyber proficiency. But just to throw out a couple of ideas, we can organize joint training activities, particularly cybersecurity exercises around incident handling. We can facilitate the sharing of cyber policy or strategy documents. We can identify national points of contact to facilitate the adoption or application of confidence building measures. And we can continue to facilitate dialogue among diverse stakeholders, including through events and fora such as this. Building capacity in this way can potentially help states not only advance their own national cyber resilience, but also allow them to participate more effectively in international cyber discussions, such as the UN Open-Ended Working Group. I think we might hear about this in a little bit. Um, and in this way, together, we can help contribute to greater international peace and security. And can I also just add that effective capacity-building cooperation can help maximize resources and avoid duplication of efforts. This is important to all of us. If successful training courses exist in one region, perhaps we could just translate them or adapt them to another region without having to start from scratch. This is a point that's going to resonate with everyone, whether you're a donor or an implementer or a recipient country. So this takes me to my third and final point, and I promise I'm wrapping up in just a minute. Does this work? Am I just blowing hot air, or does this cross-regional cooperation actually um, function? It does, and we've got some examples to share with you. This GFCE is a perfect example, um, particularly with the creation of regional hubs. The GFCE Americas Hub, which I think some of you may have already heard me reference, is housed at the OAS and works to support with intra-regional and inter-regional exchanges. Um, including with the GFCE South Asia Hub, who I think we may at least hear some reference to in just a bit. In fact, we just had a meeting yesterday of all the uh, GFCE regional hubs, and we had an opportunity to discuss our 2024 work plan and ways in which we plan to strengthen our cooperation, including with the newly established Africa Hub. So we are um, putting words to paper and mapping out um, coordinated joint activities. For our part, and again, what I know best and most is the OAS and the work that we've been doing over the past years. So I can just say that for our part, we have had success in working with the European Union 
uh, through its global cyber direct initiatives to support capacity building in the Americas, particularly through the EU-funded Latin America and Caribbean Cyber Competence Center, Center better known as LAC4. We've also worked with uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSI. Uh, I saw Sylvia here earlier. We work to exchange views on confidence building measures in cyberspace and how can each region potentially learn new confidence building measures from the experience of others. And I think we will again hear more. Um, I'm not as equipped to speak about what's happening on the other side of the globe, but we do understand that ASEAN Singapore and their cybersecurity center of excellence uh, works closely with Japan's center to develop effective cybersecurity skills among ASEAN. Uh, officials, and I certainly hope that we will hear in the next um, minutes about other successful cross-regional experiences here on this panel. But certainly, and again, both in our regional hub capacity uh, and just as a really sincere multilateralist, I think that global fora like the GFCE and the UN Open-Ended Working Group can play a really important, <clears throat> excuse me, a really important role in compiling these efforts and coordinating a global capacity building agenda based on the good work already being carried out in these different regions. So regardless, whether it's through inter-regional exchanges or th through a more international or global approach, regions absolutely need to seek ways to share their experiences and good practice with others. Uh, our global cybersecurity and resilience absolutely depends on it. So you don't have to tell me now whether I convinced you or not. Let's wait uh, to hear the rest of the panel um, about the importance of cross-regional cooperation and dialogue. We are fully committed. Thanks so much. Randy, I turn it back over to you. Is this mine or yours? Allison, thank you so much uh, for those great words. And I think you're going to hear a lot of those similar themes as we get into our panel discussion. Uh, I heard Gordina talk about how half of her talking points are gone. So we'll, it's all right. We'll, we will we'll keep her on her toes a little bit. But again, I, I do want to reiterate my thanks to you all for sticking around uh, for this last session. And uh, a lot of our friends here in the, group, in the, in the crowd, y gracias a todos que están aquí con nosotros hoy. Uh, I'm going to introduce our phenomenal speakers uh, in the order that they'll speak. Um, first, we're going to have Mr. Carlos Leonardo, who is the director of the Dominican Republic National Sea cert um, and uh, has been an uh, absolute uh, expert advocate um, for cybersecurity capacity building and working across regions to support uh, not just the Dominican Republic, but all the countries across the Americas and in Europe as well. So thank you for joining us. After that, we're going to hear from Ms. Gordina Hector Morel, who is the Director of Cybersecurity in the Ministry of Information, Communication, Technologies, uh, Utilities and Energy in Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, she is also uh, the, the capital rep to the Open-Ended Working Group, as well as a Women in Cyber Fellow with the OAS, uh, and uh, a true, true expert uh, and advocate for Antigua and Barbuda, as well as the rest of the Caribbean and Latin America as well. Uh, and then finally, and certainly not least, we're going to hear from Alan Cavanlong, who is the Regional Director for the Southeast Asia with the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. And I just thank you for your work uh, with the GFCE and everything that you've done over these past two days, but also all your work that you did uh, in the Philippines, including serving as Assistant Secretary for Cybersecurity and Enabling Technologies in the Department of Information and Communications Technologies. So playing off of uh, Allison's remarks, this concept of stronger together and working together, right? And we, we talk about this a lot, but we never really give those examples of what it takes to build those relationships and then utilize those relationships to work together towards this common cause. So Carlos, if I could start with you, I wanna hear some of the things that you've done in the Dominican Republic, but also working across regions that have proven successful and maybe something that can be adopted by our friends in the room. So Carlos. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, but I have to repeat it. You have to drink a lot of beer. Drink a lot of beer. For those you have that... to drink a lot of beer. 
That's the first step. And then you have to build those, uh, that uh, trust relationship between the, the organization, the national organization and the international ones. In our case, uh, for example, OAS and Social America has been a very, very important support for, for us in Dominican Republic since we were, we were writing our national cybersecurity strategy since the beginning. Um, they are supporting us uh, in all the process, not only in the development of the national framework, the legal framework, the standards, and, and, and the, the governance framework. Also, in the development of the capacity building programs, uh, uh, helping us to connect with others, initiative, international initiative, like uh, GFC, like FIRST, uh, and that, a lot of them. Uh, so I, I guess we can, uh, in, in my opinion, when we talk about, uh, for example, Cecil Americans, uh, I was, uh, I see them as our big brother. And the, the key uh, to help to establish uh, over the time that relationship is to present the results. When the international organizations see that the country that they are helping is presenting results, important results, not only in technical ways, also moving national indicators, international indicators, they say, hey, yes, we have to keep the support to, to, to that country. And also, not only, maybe uh, Central America in this case is, is not uh, almighty, but the important thing is not to know how to do it. The important thing is to have the contact or the number of the person to know how to do it. And that's, that's what we got of the different uh, international organizations. The support and the networking that we, that we need to build a capacity, a cyber resilient capacity um, a strategy in each country. Thank you for that. Gordina, I want to hear from your experiences because we talked earlier and we talked about these relationships and we talked about you know, these different organizations, multilateral organizations or bilateral uh, uh, partnerships. Can you talk about some of your experiences at Antigua and Barbuda uh, and what you've all done uh, in the country to, to strengthen and bring those stronger relationships together? Thank you, Randy. Good afternoon, everyone. So for us in Antigua and Barbuda, we have been able we have been able to benefit from our relationship with organizations such as CARICOM Impacts, which looks at the 15 islands of the CARICOM, and they provide cybersecurity and cybercrime capacity training for our, um, the members through cooperation with their partners, be they the EU, um, OAS, or private partners as well. Then we have OAS. It's a good one for me. <laughs> so OAS has the c search Americas. And so for Antigua and Barbuda, we are in the, what I call the infancy stage of developing our c -cert. But we have been able to rely on some assistance from OAS, and that is through the networking Colors would drink beer, but I would drink sparkling water. <laughs> through that network, we <laughs> through that network, we're able to to um, benefit from the capacity building. Now, OAS also has a working group on confidence building measures, and through that, they have a CBM portal, which has contact information 
and it serves as a repository for the policies and the legislations of the various members. And so we're able to utilize that as well. Then we come to the women in cyber, and OAS has been instrumental in coordinating on behalf of Canada the women in cyber from Latin America and the Caribbean, and I'm one of those proud beneficiaries. Um, so we're able to benefit from cyber diplomacy and the whole UN process through that capacity building. I recall the first time back, I think, in 2020, um, there was almost gender parity at the UN OEWG meeting. And so we continue to build on those. There we go. Going across the, uh, the world a little bit, moving away from the Western Hemisphere, uh, I, I do want to talk, Alan, about some of the things you're doing, obviously, in, in, in the Asia region, but I, I do want to hear a little bit more about what GFCE is doing, and, and Gordina talked about what the OAS and that great team is doing in the Americas, really serving as kind of that convener, that bringing the people together, so as Carlos said, building those relationships and having those beers. Uh, so, so could you talk about you know, the role that GFCE plays, particularly in the Asian region, but also your experience in the Philippines and what you saw in terms of cross-state or cross-regional collaboration? Yeah, thank you, Randy. Uh, first, I would like, I'd like to discuss uh, intra-region. So locally, when I was still the head of the cybersecurity for the Philippines, we um, collaborate mostly in our ASEAN member states' neighbors. So we sign MOU with them. We sign... Uh, agreement with them in terms of cooperation in, in, in capacity building. So we signed with Malaysia, we signed with Singapore. That is to um, establish rapport and support no, for our efforts in have in, uh, to achieve cyber resilience in the region. So now wearing the GFC hat is uh, looking at the region itself. No? GFC is a multi-stakeholder uh, um, approach no? in, uh, in implementing, in avoiding duplication, in, in, in implementing cyber resilience in, in, in the region. So we are working closely together with the cybersecurity agencies of Singapore, where the GFCE is hosted in the ASCCE, or the ASEAN Singapore Center of Excellence, uh, Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, in, within the uh, premises of the CSA. So with that, I believe um, the, the ASCCE is hosting uh, capacity building within the region. For example, uh, the last um, UN Singapore Cyber Fellowship was hosted and the GFC was invited to collaborate with other member countries in ASEAN to foster collaboration within the region and also outside of the region. So with that, I think uh, with the GFCE's presence in Southeast Asia, it will build more um, uh, collaboration, not just within the Southeast Asia, but also sharing of these best practices in Southeast Asia to the other region. So I think um, with our tools, the civil portal, the clearinghouse mechanism, uh, it will provide um, more opportunities in the Southeast Asia region to cooperate, to collaborate, to share best practices, and also to build capacity. Because, you know, Southeast Asia is a region where uh, we have different cultures, different economies, different status of technology. If you, you cannot compare Singapore to Cambodia. You cannot compare Philippines to, to other, other countries. So we have our own uh, uh, technological development, but with this, this is a challenge, but it's, it also provides opportunity to improve, right, by working together. I think that's great, and uh, just thinking about who we have in the crowd, who here has met someone new over these past two days of this conference? Were they from your region or from a different region, right? We've all met new people. so. I do want to go across the board, and I'll start, Alan, since you have the mic, I'll stay with you. The value of these kind of 
events. The value of these kind of engagements for starting that first step towards collaboration and sharing of those best practices that you were alluding to. Yes, there are two types of collaboration. Informal one, which uh, Carlos uh, mentioned. When I was still with the police force, uh, we just drink beer and collaborate, right? <laughs> right? Just drink whiskey and, and collaborate and share in information. But formally, we have to build an information sharing platform within the region, right? Which is now the, the ASEAN countries are building. We have two actually. We have one in Singapore and one in Bangkok, in, in, in Thailand. Uh, the Bangkok is supported by, the, by ASEAN Japan, Cyber Capacity Building Center. And in Singapore, we have the ASEAN Singapore Cyber Security Center of Excellence. So with this, I, I believe uh, the formal, the formal uh, platform for information sharing uh, are now being, is, is now present in, in the region. And these two centers in ASEAN can provide more um, capacity building, not just training, not just development of cyber strategies, not just uh, capture the flag for the, for the, for the certs, no? but also for cyber crime, because Interpol is in Singapore. Exactly. Rodina, I'm, I'm interested because uh, Alan brought up information sharing, and, and I know Antigua Barbuda is in the process of building and developing their cert. Uh, and we, we talked earlier about the important role that Trinidad has had in supporting. Can you talk a little bit about how those relationships, how those relationships were formed, and, and the benefit that you're seeing in terms of these uh, interregional uh, engagements and these networks like CSERT Americas? Okay, thanks. So these networks were formed through training programs that we would have attended together. And so the networking, the informal networking started there. It has benefited us a lot in terms of if I have an issue, I normally sound off to my colleague, Angus Smith, in Trinidad. And now I have Sumitri in Bahamas. I have Dale, who I've worked with. So we sound out one another. Um, if there is an issue that I have that we can't solve, I can call upon them. And so I have found that networking, that collaboration to be quite beneficial in terms of how we are progressing in terms of organizing our cert. I did not want to reinvent the wheel, and so I drew on the experiences that they would have had and um, to set things in motion for our CSERT. That's great. Uh, Carlos, I do want to turn to you. Um, I want to switch it up a little bit and talk about beyond just within the Americas or in the Caribbean or in the Southeast Asian region. I want to talk about sharing of best practices and partnering with other regions of the world. I recall in 2019, OAS, with the Canadian government support, went to Singapore for a series of ICT workshops uh, that was led by Carrie Ann Barrett worked with Allison and team. And it was a phenomenal two days and we were able to develop a lot of those relationships and, and kind of pick each other's brains. So can you talk about some of the work you've done going beyond the region and partners and experiences that you've had? Yeah, de definitely, definitely if we can, if we talk about not in technical uh, way, not in, in the uh, strategic, uh, we, we have established collaboration with uh, other countries, as uh, Estonia. For example, the Estonia National CERT was our principal sponsorship, sponsor for the, for the first application process. And the other one um, was uh, United States. So, uh, and today, we are still still sharing not only information, threat intelligence information, also we are sharing technology, we are sharing knowledge, we are sharing best practice. Um, for example, you, you came is here from Interpol, and we have 12 hours difference 
Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, you Kim? Uh, yeah. um, sometimes I have to wake up him at 3 a.m., 3 p.m. for me, to ask him for the collaboration and to ask him, uh, hey, we, we, we have that, that malware sample that we need the, the support from Interpol and Singapore, and we have that. Uh, in, in another case, we have collaborated, for example, with uh, yeah, Spain and other countries here, also in the region. And as I say, it's not only in, in technical uh, matters, uh, also in the how to build and replicate those capacity and that talent. Uh, if you remember that 15 years ago, the same people that who has spoken uh, about cybercrime and just leading lead la, the cybercrime policy, they are the same people that are leading the cybersecurity policy and strategy now in our country. And we were only a few. And with the support of the international organization, we, 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 we was able to replicate the uh, capacity in other person. Sometimes I have to send an email to myself because I have the, the role on the hat of the national police of the cybercrime unit. And sometimes I have to ask the collaboration to the, to the police uh, from the third. I have to send an email to myself. Uh, so today, in the case of the, our cyber ambassador, uh, Claudio Pegueros, he is uh, He's creating the cyber academy in the foreign affairs uh, offices, and it, not only in the that's capacity building, all, also in the operational way, and that only can be done with the support all of the international organization at the cross-border cooperation. Thank you for that. Alan, I'm going to turn to you before going to go down with a different question, but kind of same, similar thoughts, you know, what are some of the experiences you've seen going across regions? And obviously GFC does a good job of cataloging a lot of what's going on, but maybe what are some of the things you've seen with, you know, across Asia, with maybe Latin America or Europe or other entities? Yes, actually last, uh, last month I was in Korea, South Korea. So we have an APC hub there, in partnership with World Bank, with World Bank and uh, KSPO of uh, South Korea, with the, with the GFC. So we, we conducted uh, um, a cybercrime investigation training for uh, the prosecutors, for the judges, for the, for the police officers, and CERT. Uh, because we, we believe um, uh, this interdisciplinary ro role right, in fighting cybercrime, in protecting our cyberspace, is important, right? and we have to build a capacity not just in one discipline but across discipline. Um, this APC hub, uh, which which uh, GFC is one of the uh, core organizer, is meeting every year in South Korea, twice a year actually, to to uh, promote cross regional, so not just Southeast Asia, but also the whole Asia and the Pacific. So Samoa, Mongolia, and Vietnam were the uh, ones who were trained in South Korea last month. And with this, I believe with, with a cross-regional approach in, in uh, identifying the needs, right? First, we identify the needs. What are the needs of uh, these countries? If they have similar needs, then we group them together so that we avoid uh, duplication of efforts. With that, we can provide just one um, activity. We hit three birds in one stone, right? So I think uh, uh, we can do that uh, as one of the best practices that we can also apply in other regions so that we can, of course, save, save USD, yeah. <laughs> save Euro. <laughs> in in uh, uh, producing these events, right? And, and also at the same time, target the specific needs of 
our constituents, of our, of our partners, members. Yeah. That's, that's why uh, GFC, uh, I've been here for four months, the GFC is a very important uh, platform, forum for capacity building, I believe, in, uh, in promoting and avoiding duplication of efforts. Yeah, uh, agreed. And I, I think back to Allison's remarks earlier about that lacking, uh, stopping the redundancy of, of, of programs, you know, stop duplicating efforts, taking sharing best practices. Uh, it's not just good practice for anything in life, but it's a cost saver. And for, a, you know, a lot of our countries, you know, it, it matters that you can save a little bit. I am going to turn to the audience in a little bit for questions after this next line. So if you have a question, just point at me, throw me up a finger, a good finger, please. Uh, and then uh, we'll go over to the questions in a little bit. But Gordon, I, I want to hear from you again, uh, certainly on these, these cross-regional uh, approaches and what your experiences have been cross-regionally. But I also want to talk about the receiver side, right? When you're getting this capacity building support from other regions or from other states within your region, you know, the need for political will and political leadership to be able to form those information sharing agreements and to frankly build those relationships that allow you to, you know, absorb said capacity. Thanks, Randy. <laughs> So yes, you're right, political leadership is quite important, um, ensuring the advancements in capacity building. Um, the policies, strategies, as well as the coordination of the recipient states are important, and the political leaders are best placed to know what the needs and priorities are of those states. And so I would want to say that it is important to have that political buy-in or that political will for the capacity building within the states, not just because it works someplace else, means that it will work in Antigua and Barbuda. You have to take the culture into consideration, the needs of the state. So. I would think that a needs assessment would be quite essential. And then you'd want to have consultation, the donor would have want to have consultation with the recipient to ensure that the national agenda or priorities are taken into consideration. There must be a balance between the objectives of the donor as well as the priorities of the recipient. And of course, I would want to stress that we use cross-sectoral approach, and as usual, we want to say, um, <laughs> avoid duplication of efforts. Yeah. And that's certainly a communication thing as well. Alan, I, I do want to go to you and talk about this culture, right? Because Asia is notorious for having so many different cultures across different states. How do you build that trust and relationships across the culture? Well, uh, if in order to build trust, yeah. you must you must show, you know, show them that you trust them, right? It's it's QPQ, right? It's a I tap your back, you tap, you you tap mine. So um, it's not about uh, um, one ASEAN member states not trusting the other, but uh, it's about how you give trust as well. That's that's inherent to us, right? So that's why we have the ASEAN way, right? Uh, in, in my past hat, in my past life, uh, I attended many bilaterals, bi bilateral meetings. And in ASEAN, we can, we can fix things in the sidelines, right? We just talk in the sidelines. But in the table, we can disagree. <laughs> but in, in the sidelines, we agree. So with that, uh, the ASEAN way is uh, something, the culture, uh, we are not really direct, unlike in the Western countries, right? So we, for example, uh, are, you, are you doing good? Yes, we are doing it, but actually not, right? So that's why uh, you have to understand culture when dealing with, uh, with, with ASEAN, okay? Uh, 
Yes, we know that there, there, are, there are some uh, ASEAN executives that you know, uh, learned from other schools in, in the West. So yes, they also adopt directness in terms of answering some questions from the other ASEAN. But anyways, uh, the, my, my point here is uh, the coordination, the collaboration among ASEAN member states, especially um, in cybersecurity. I, I, I remember in 2018, when we were uh, discussing about the, U the UN uh, norms on, on cyberspace, the 11 norms on cyberspace, the ASEAN member states already agreed on that 11 member, uh, 11 uh, norms on cyberspace. And, you know, these are the things that I believe the ASEAN is working together, stronger together. And I hope, since we are only 10, <laughs> right. unlike, unlike other regions, uh, so many, right? So I think uh, it's manageable, and I believe with that culture uh, of uh, being close, you know, even if uh, we are not speaking the same language, <laughs> right? Uh, well, we are, uh, I believe uh, we are uh, stronger together. Thank, thank you for that. Gordina, you want to comment on that? And in being stronger together, we know that it is said that a chain is as strong as its weakest link. Yeah. And so we would not want to leave anyone behind. And so we would all want to work together. As Alison had said earlier, this conference in itself is a confidence capacity building measure. And so I believe leaving this conference we will be a little bit stronger than when we came, and I think that we will go forth stronger as we build and leverage on the networking that we would have done during this time. Yeah, and I'm sure those links yes, will I, be stronger I, with dinner. Carlos, final comment on the, the culture piece no, and the relationship I, I, piece. I, I, I only want to add that I have 14 new WhatsApp numbers <laughs> since yesterday, so. There's 14. All right, we're going to go to the audience now. I know, Robert, we have a question. Are there any other questions in the audience we could take multiple at a time? Oh, I thought you, you want, did want a question, right? Uh, I thought you waved at um, Yes, yeah, so I, I think the main thing I'm going to take away is the importance of beer. Um, uh, Cordina did say water will do. But it, it makes me think... Um, a virtual beer is not as good as a real beer. And during the pandemic, we all moved to virtual meetings. And companies said, don't worry, you can stay virtual. But now they're all moving back to the office. And it makes me think, for cyber capacity building, we've tried doing online events and trainings. And there's a swing back towards doing them in person. And I wondered what your experience is of those two uh, and whether, how do we get the balance between virtual meetings, virtual trainings, virtual conferences, and doing this in person? Thanks, Robert. Uh, Carlos, I, wa I want to go to you on that question. They talked about it earlier today, right, that we're a technical community inherently, but being virtual is not the same as he alluded to. So how do you balance that? virtual cross regional but also that true need for that in-person relationship building and maybe talk about your experience over the past couple of days. Yes, definitely you can build that also with coffee, not necessarily with beer. Um, and definitely that's, this this space are the space that had, that help us to build those close relations. It's not the same when you when we are seeing the, uh, the, the face uh, between uh, the screen or throughout the screen. Uh, for example, uh, one month ago, I guess, or two, two months ago, so we start to, to, to collaborate, to receive the collaboration from Chicago Server in an incident that we have investigation that we are, uh, we are conducting related with an incident. But, we not only have internet by email, so now I have the opportunity to know the person behind that email. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. 20 minutes ago. So the relationship is different, 
the, uh, the approach is different, the, I, I, I'm sure that the results will be different. No, absolutely. And you really realize how tall some people are. Uh, I met my, gen my friend over here from Canada, uh, and he is absolutely massive. Uh, so it, it's really, it's incredible to see that. Gordina, what about your past uh, experiences here? For me, um, during the COVID, yes, we were on many virtual sessions. And um, it was good to finally reach out and touch somebody else. It's that human factor that we were missing. Um, I met Audrey, Audrey from Ghana, um, virtually during a session online. Um, I think it might have been hosted by OAS. But today was the first time I met her physically. And we hugged. It was just, we just embraced one another. It was just so good to finally meet her in person. So, yes, the virtual is good, but I, I think we need that physical contact. No, certainly, and that virtual is necessary, right, to maintain, especially when you're growing cross regions. Uh, any other questions in the audience? I, trust me, I got plenty. Okay, hearing none, I, I was that something, Alan? Oh, I saw Alan wave like that. Um, I, I do want to talk, ask, where we are? Oh, Aaron, please. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm Aaron Taylor. I'm with USAID based in Jamaica. So I'm really glad to see some of our fellow Caribbean <laughs> folks here. And so I, I'm hoping to hear a little bit about sort of what in your perspective are the top capacity building needs in the region um, in cyber and sort of how can the region work to better work together to sort of address those needs if you have any ideas for, for further cooperation and how um, other partners in the community such as like the donor community can help support that. Biggest needs in the region? I think tabletop exercises. <laughs> what, what does that look like, though? What is it, what, when you say table talk exercise, what do you mean? Especially the ones where we draw the islands of the Caribbean together. So there is, if there is a cyber incident, we can, how we work together as a team throughout the Caribbean. <laughs> because something may happen in Antigua and it affects somebody in uh, affects Trinidad or Barbados, that sort of thing. So I like those type of tabletop exercises. I think they would be quite beneficial for us in the Caribbean. Alan, what are you seeing uh, in Southeast Asia? Well, um, in Southeast Asia, I witness many capacity building uh, activities you know, from strategy, development of strategy, development of cybercrime strategy, cybersecurity strategy, development of uh, tabletop exercises um, in terms of, you know, uh, cert response. And um, internally, it's within the country. It's still working together. Because, you know, there are the Department of ICT, the, the Department of Justice, the, the police force. So in, in a tabletop exercise, you have to involve all of, all of them. So that you can, you know, you can uh, practice, you can simulate, you know. I, I, I remember there were uh, cyber door exercises for Asia. And, you know, we, we normally do that periodically in ASEAN. Uh, Singapore is, is participating, Thailand is participating. And that is one way of working together, right? Because, you know, the, the criminals are also working together then why cannot work together, right? So with these activities in the region, I think you can, they, these countries, the region would be able to um, strengthen the resiliency on cyberspace. Carlos, are you seeing some of the same things in Dominican Republic, uh, those, those needs? What are the biggest needs that you're seeing? Yeah, I'm, I'm totally agree with uh, Gordina. We, we need more, more action together. 
not only uh, change those uh, lesser learns, we have to put in practice. It's, it's like the CBMs and the confidence uh, building measures. We all of country, we we know them. We. We, maybe we have implemented in our national security strategy where we don't have it, in, we don't have those CBMs in action yet. And only with the interaction, with the uh, exercise, and um, with the practice uh, in different uh, scenarios, that the way that we can be sure that we can handle any situation when it's present. It does. Well, we only have about three minutes left, so we're going to do one round uh, across the board. I'll ask for brief remarks, and I'll start Alan and work down to Carlos. The final question is, for those in the audience, for those watching online, for those that want to be part of some of these regional organizations or get involved in building those stronger together type of arrangements, what would be your advice to these countries, individuals, organizations? Well, uh, let's work together, I work with GFC, um, GFC, the region, uh, not just the region, globally, uh, is here to assist you in identifying your, the needs, right, and um, what to implement in the region or in your respective uh, countries. So work with other stakeholders, work with, uh, other, work with other countries, because, uh, you know, um, the threats are, the cyber threats, the cyber criminals are also working together, right? So let's work together, not just regionally, but cross-regional, so that we can be resilient in cyberspace. Thank you, Al. Gordina. What are your thoughts? What are some of those first steps that folks in the room or those watching online can, uh, can take? Um, I would want to urge our governments to give serious consideration when um, we are offered capacity building um, training to ensure that they're going to fit the needs um, of our country and uh, they will benefit us in terms of what we will be facing. Of course, I would want to urge us that we continue to work together, build on those informal networks, but at the same time, I'm also cognizant that there may be requirements for formal um, channels of communication. And um, let us work together to make um, cyberspace a little bit safer for all of us. I sense there's going to be an alcohol remark here, but Carlos, final words. Let me keep it simple. Let's meet at the bar, and let's see what happens from there. <laughs> Uh, and on those great words, we are one step closer to the bar and dinner. Uh, no, in, in all truth, in all, in, in, without jest here, uh, phenomenal discussions and phenomenal experiences. And, and, and I think we've really pushed home that point about we're stronger together and, and take the opportunity to meet someone you haven't met before. Take the opportunity to engage and share a joke and a laugh. Uh, if you want to see pictures of my son, you're welcome to. I love him to death. But use this opportunity and these, opportun these engagement opportunities because, as we talked about, there's not a lot of opportunities for us to do this in person uh, throughout the year, uh, especially if you're in different regions. So um, meet someone new, commit to action, not just exchange LinkedIn information, but commit to action because uh, truly we are stronger together. So thank you. One more round of applause for our great panelists here. Uh, we do have a very brief gift for our speakers here, so Mariana, if I could invite you onto the stage. Oh, I get one too, that's great. Thank you very much.